My name is Sarah Richardson and I'm a professor of modern British history at the University of Warwick. On the night of June the 20th, 1913, a maidservant, Helen Smith, living at the Grove on Warwick Road in Solihull, was awoken with a noise like thunder. She went to the window and saw a neighbouring residence, Hazelwood House, consumed by flames. By the time that fire crews arrived from Solihull and Alton, the house was described as a furnace, and shortly afterwards, the roof fell in. This was no accident. The unoccupied house had been targeted by militant suffragettes who broke in using newspaper and soft soap to deaden the sound. They smeared oil and treacle on the windows to aid the spread of the fire and planted an improvised explosive device. On making their escape, they left two printed postcards on the lawn addressed to Mr Justice Fillimore, who had recently imprisoned suffragette militants for similar activities. One said, Judge, not that ye be judged, votes for women. And the second, release our comrades, votes for women. Of course, the militant suffragettes were a tiny minority and not representative of the vast numbers of women and men who joined the suffrage societies to fight for the vote. A more typical Solihull campaigner, perhaps, was Mrs. Mrs. Harvey Brooks, the wife of the rector of Solihull, who held regular drawing room meetings to host speakers and to raise money for the cause. However, the militants' recourse to violence demonstrated the immense frustration felt by all women at the refusal of women to, of Parliament to consider their case. Their mass campaign to gain the vote had begun nearly 50 years earlier, in 1866, when they presented a petition to Parliament to amend a reform bill which was going to enfranchise all working class male heads of households. That petition, like the many that followed, failed and fell on deaf ears. The Mapping Women's Suffrage Project works with academics, local history groups, and members of the general public, seeking to capture as many of the amazing women and some men who were active in the fight to gain women the vote over a century ago. Many may be familiar with the leaders of the suffrage movement, Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst of the Militant Women's Social and Political Union, and Millicent Garrett Fawcett of the more moderate National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. However, the focus on leadership and on activism in London obscures the stories of hundreds and thousands of ordinary people who put pressure on the government to extend the vote to women. Everyone who lived through the tumultuous period of the struggle for women to gain the vote would have either been directly involved in the campaign themselves or would have known somebody in their community who was an activist. The suffragette down their street, perhaps. Suffrage activities, as we've seen, did not just take place in London, at Westminster, but all over the country, in drawing rooms, on streets, and in the cottage gardens of rural villages. This was a campaign that touched the lives of everyone. The women who joined the various societies came from all walks of life, vicar's wives, teachers, factory workers, watchmakers, writers and schoolgirls, and in spite of implacable opposition from the government, they never gave up the fight. Women like Laura Ainsworth, who with three others became the first in the country to be force-fed. Laura was born in Northumberland in 1885. She was educated in Salisbury, and after leaving school, she became a teacher. When she joined the WSPU, she resigned from her teaching post and moved to Birmingham. In September 1909, Ainsworth conducted a rooftop pro protest at Bingley Hall in Birmingham, where the Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, was addressing a meeting from which all women had been excluded. Using an axe, they removed slates from the roof and threw them down at the police below. They were only brought down when three policemen went up and dragged them off the roof. Ainsworth, Rona Robinson, Charlotte Marsh and Mary Lee were sentenced to two weeks imprisonment. On arriving at Winston Green Prison on, 20, on the 22nd of September, Ainsworth broke the window in her cell. She wanted to be treated as a political offender. 
She said, accordingly, at nine o'clock in the evening, I was taken to the punishment cell, a cold, dark room on the ground floor where light only shines on very bright days with no furniture in it. The four women decided to go on hunger strike, a strategy that had been developed by Marion Wallace Dunlop a few weeks earlier. Wallace Dunlop had been immediately released when she had tried this in Holloway Prison, but the governor of Winston Green was willing to feed the three women by force. The prison doctor recorded of Ainsworth that she is very determined and it is necessary still to administer food through the tube. Ainsworth later took the prison governor and the doctor to court for assault. On appeal, the judge found that assault had been committed, but that it was legal because the intervention was intended to save lives. The court case graphically revealed the brutality of force feeding. Laura was placed in a chair, held down by four or five war dresses, her head forcibly pulled back, her mouth forced open, and milk was poured down her throat through a feeding cup. The officials then endeavoured to force lines up her nose for nasal feeding, but failed because her nose had been broken during the rooftop protest when Yobbs had thrown stones and bricks up at her. On her release, Ainsworth was taken straight to a nursing home, suffering from congestion of the lungs and inflammation of the throat, and she had lost over 13 pounds in weight. Although suffragette militancy and violence have always grabbed the headlines, the suffrage map charts the experiences of the vast majority of the more moderate activists. For example, one of the most successful groups in Warwickshire was the Conservative and Unionist Women's Franchise Association. The county boasted more branches of the association than anywhere else in the country mainly due to the actions of the local and the national president, Lady Marie Willoughby de Brooke of Compton Burney in South Warwickshire, and her neighbour who became secretary of the main Warwickshire branch, Francis Donisthorpe of Wellsbourne. There were sub-branches of the association at Leamington, Warwick, Rugby and Kenilworth. The branches arranged numerous meetings and events from 1911 onwards to garner support for a conciliation bill. Lady Willoughby de Brooke was one of the most energetic participants in the campaign. On the 13th of July, she held an at home to raise money for a paid organiser, to visit local women municipal electors and to persuade them to sign petitions, which would be sent to local MPs asking them to vote for the bill. Later that month, the Warwickshire branches joined with other local suffrage societies to hold a massive demonstration in Stratford, which the women marched in a procession through the principal streets, headed by a band. In September, she organised a garden meeting, attended mainly by the wives of farmers and labourers in the village of Combrook. Francis Donisthorpe was an even more interesting character. Born in 1870 into a large family who made their fortune in textiles, Frances was described as an ardent follower of the corn hunt, which is possibly why she moved to Warwickshire, as Lord Willoughby de Brooke was master of the Warwickshire hunt. Frances' census entry reveals that in 1911, she was living as head of the household with a woman friend. Frances was clearly intrepid, and that may explain her interest in the cause of women's suffrage. During the war, she was an ambulance driver in Romania and Antwerp before joining the famous all-female Hackett Lowther unit, which served on the Western Front, later receiving the Croix de Guerre from the French army. Frances lived the rest of her life with Gabrielle de Montillon at East England Hall in Upton on Severn. Frances and Gabrielle were friends of Radcliffe Hall, whose novel The Well of Loneliness was the subject of an obscenity trial in the 1920s. The novel, which was partly written at Eastington, centres on a love affair between two women, one of whom drove an ambulance in World War I. The map also reveals the contributions of working class women, such as Sarah Wanley of Coventry. Sarah lived with her husband, a storekeeper, her daughter and a boarder in a small five roomed house in Coventry in 1911. She remained there for the rest of her life. As a dressmaker, Sarah's wages would have been meagre, 
So the extra income from a lodger must have been welcome. There are a few contemporary accounts of Sarah's votes for women's activity. However, an interview with her in the 1930s reveals that she was a member of the moderate Coventry Women's Suffrage Society. In the interview, Sarah rejected suffragette militant tactics, asserting that people get resentful of a movement that only causes trouble. Nothing ever came of violence. She recalled, though, that one of her most uh, exciting moments as a suffrage campaigner came at a mass meeting in nearby Warwick, where she arrived late and was mistaken for the WSPU suffragette leader, Emmeline Pankhurst. Sarah claimed to have been greeted with both enthusiastic cheering and jeering from the crowd in equal measure. Sarah's husband was opposed to votes for women, but she was resolute, stating, it made no difference to me. It is only right that women should have the vote. And asked if she would do it all again. Sarah replied with an emphatic, I would. The Mapping Women's Suffrage Project is already changing our views of the suffrage campaign. It highlights the diversity of the activists, single women, married women, those in same-sex relationships, women of colour and women of all classes and backgrounds. It has demonstrated how the suffrage movement reached all corners of Britain, from tiny hamlets to large cities, and from cottages and tenements to stately homes and suburban villas. It highlights the varied tactics used to pressure the government to give women the vote. The campaign was nothing if not creative. But most of all, it connects the activists of yesterday with those fighting for change today. The stories of past exploits resonate with those campaigning in a hostile environment for climate change or for human rights. As one Nuneaton woman noted in response to the project, the suffrage campaign was not just about ladies in London in big hats, it was about women like me. The stories of amazing women of the past continue to inspire and encourage amazing women of today. The reasons why women should have the vote are obvious to every fair-minded person. Here I am, a very proud old militant suffragette. 